It's only day two and although the weather's changed, we're having the most spectacular start to our Sherbourne spring. Yes, there have been millions of mayfly down on the brook. We've had predatory woodpeckers terrorising our tree creepers and we've got tons of tenacious tits. I'm revelling in river life down here at Sherbourne Brook, discovering some of the surprising creatures that call this place home. And I'm still in stunning Shetland. It may be drizzly, but we're here to brighten up your Tuesday evening. Oh yes, it's time for Spring, Spring Watch. Watch. Oh, I wish I hadn't <laughs> done that. Yes, hello and welcome to Spring Watch 2018. It's our second programme coming to you live from the National Trust Sherbourne Park Estate here in Gloucester. Our mission, as yesterday, is to bring you the very best of British wildlife. Unfortunately, not on an evening with the very best of British weather. Yesterday, we were in colourful polo tops and other attire, but today it's jackets. Oh, these jackets on. But we're not going to allow this to dampen our ardour at all. I struggled with that, didn't I? Dampen our ardour. <laughs> it was a brave <laughs> I got attempt. It I got it out. <laughs> uh, at all. Because we think we've got a great show for you tonight. Lots of new nests, actually. And let's see what's been happening over overnight. Let's start off with the badgers. We saw a lot of the badgers yesterday. And in particular, the Mark Almond set. That's what we've named one of the badgers. That isn't Mark. That's another adult doing a lot of excavating. They'll do a lot of this all the way through the year. They'll be wanting to get any rubbish out of that set. Two cubs in that family. And we've seen a lot of activity from those cubs, a lot of playing, a lot of scratching. And we've got a little bat flying through there as well. We didn't see anything of Mark last night, though. I mean, we saw him on the show. He said hello, and he seems to have waved goodbye. <laughs> Actually, he's on tour, Chris. He really is as well. He's, he's doing a sort of 80s revival festival tour, I think. Can I just say, there's a long series. Yeah. If you use up all of your almond jokes straight away, you're going to run dry. No, no, I've got a lot. Have you? Oh, yes. I never saw you as a big, a soft cell fan, you know. <laughs> I'm just wondering how you're going to stretch them all Say out. hello, wave goodbye. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, let's have a look at some of our live cameras. What should we look at? Let's look at... Uh, the marsh tit camera. This is a new camera, well, a new nest for us. We've never had marsh tits before. That's the exterior, and it's in that little slit in the tree. And if we go in, we can see the marsh tit chicks in there. There are six chicks, and they're about 10 days old. They're doing really well. Um, they're being fed by both parents. Let's have a look at some of the feeding. Now, there we go. We can see the nest again. The adults are up in the branches. Big, fat caterpillar it's going to take into the nest. And just watch this, Chris. We've all seen this before, haven't we? We all know... I've seen it in your dressing room, to be quite honest. <laughs> the eyes are too big for the belly. You're trying to get the digestive in, and it just won't go in at all. Oh, is it going to do it? Oh, what a struggle. Look at that. But they're doing really well, because, look, Wing flapping. Yep. What do you reckon? And you can see the pin there. Um, it's not going to be too long, to be quite honest with you. So what are we now? We're Tuesday now. End of the week? Beginning End of, of the next? Week. Over End the, of the weekend, week. They maybe? might hang on over the weekend. I feel perhaps a weekend fledged. But I can tell you something interesting about last ditch. You know, we've then. got only six chicks in that nest. Yeah. And we've got 11 in our blue tit nest. Why do you think there are fewer? Uh, be because they, that, that's how many they have, maybe? Not only do they have fewer, they can control how many eggs they lay, dependent on the cross-sectional area of the hole that they're nesting in. So if they're lucky enough to find a hole which is really large, they can lay their maximum clutch size, but if they can only find a smaller hole, they actually reduce the number of eggs, because that will mean that it doesn't get overcrowded with the young. That's really clever, isn't More it? about that. Smart if only people did that in their houses. If they had small houses, you only have one kid. If you've got a big house, you could have lots of kids. I knew I should never have a sister. <laughs> if you didn't have a sister, I'd have double the bedroom space. But, Chris, there is a bit of jeopardy for our marsh tits, I hate to tell you, because look what we saw last night. It's a beautiful owl. It's a tawny owl in glorious sun that's just dipping down in the evening. But it's only 15 metres away from the marsh tip nest. And if you listen carefully, 
That's the alarm call of the adults. The owl flies off and you'll see that's when the adult marsh tick comes down and thinks it's safe to go in the nest. So we're going to have to keep an eye on that owl because it's a predator. Yes. And once it knows where those chicks are, then it's going to keep coming back. Serious predator of, of, of uh, nesting birds, actually. Normally not birds that are in holes, but we have seen them taking uh, incubating female blackbirds off of nests, even magpies and wood pigeons too. So I think they're safe whilst they're in the hole, well, at least the, the chicks, but perhaps not the not the adults. Now, marsh tit is a new nest for spring watch, but I can bring you another new nest now. It's slightly unusual, another non-native species. So let's have a look at where it is nesting. It's in this hollow in a large dead oak tree, and it's a duck, an unusual duck, a duck with claws which allow it to grip the tree. It's still got the webbed feet, but it's got the claws. And look, Look at the alacrity with which it launches and lands in that hole. So a hole nesting duck in the south of England, it's non-native, it can only be, well, the mandarin duck. Yes, the mandarin duck. Let's go inside now and see our female. So this is a species that was brought here from China in the uh, 1920s by a chap called Ezra. He released them in Surrey and they did really well. They spread very quickly across the south of England and there were tree specialists. Now, all of that down that you can see her primping about there to ensure that her eggs are well covered when she leaves the nest, she has drawn from her own chest. She's produced that deliberately. She normally only nips off for a couple of hours every day. She's putting in at least a 22-hour stint, this female. And we think that hidden under the down, she has as many as 15 eggs. So it's an unusual species this little mandarin. Well, that's the female, and as in most duck species, the female's not quite as brightly coloured as the male, but, I mean, put your sunglasses on, you know, stand back from the screen, because the male mandarin has completely overdone it. I mean, this is some sort of Versace dandy. It's a handsome duck. What do you mean? It's I, I gorgeous. Think it's a bit of a mess, frankly. Um, I, look at that sail on its back. Might appeal to certain females, but not this male, <laughs> I've got to say. Very, very colourful. Um, a very, very colourful indeed. Now, the key thing is, we don't know when the eggs were laid. What we do know is they take between 30 and 31 days to hatch. And what happens when they hatch is that the female will wait for all 15 of them to hatch, perhaps over the period of a day or so. And then those little chicks are going to have to parachute out of the tree and hopefully reach the ground safely. So we'll be keeping our eyes on those mandarins very carefully indeed. Could be a great event. That could be amazing. Mm -hmm. Shall we, we have a look at them live? Yeah, we could. There she is. It looks so cosy in there, doesn't it? But 15 eggs, I mean, that is a big clutch, isn't it? It is a big clutch. And now, initially, we thought it might have been a case of egg dumping, i.e. when a female will sneak into another female's nest and dump some of her own eggs there, because they don't typically have a clutch that large. But we've seen no other females around. In fact, we've seen very little of the male, but that's typical once he's um, got the nest going. Sometimes he hangs around, but typically they, they disappear. Great to have two firsts for spring watch, mm -hmm. the marsh tits and the mandarin duck. Right, let's have a look where we are on the map, because we're in, obviously in Sherbourne. There we are in the southwest of the country, and Gillian, 750 miles away, which is 1,207 kilometres in Shetland Islands. That's where Gillian is. It's a fabulous place for wildlife, and it's famous for its seabirds. Welcome back to Shetland. We're still on the southern tip of the island. We're here on this beautiful, peaceful evening in this gorgeous little inlet called Piri Vo. Shetlands is not just a nationally but a globally important location for seabird colonies. And even in this tiny little inlet, we've had loads of bird action. We've seen Arctic terns, we've seen fulmars, they're still out flying. We've even seen red-throated divers today. At the moment, what have we, we've got? A black guillemot. Now these are known as tysties over here in the Shetland. This one is having a lovely preen, but it's probably been out. It's an inshore bird, so it'll be out feeding on fish like butterfish. Absolute beautiful bird. Now, it's doing well here, but as we saw yesterday, many of our seabirds are not doing so well. There's been a dramatic and worrying decline, not just here, but across the country. There is one species, however, that is bucking the trend, and that is gannets. 
and I went to see for myself a few days ago on Nos, the Isle of Nos. This is just epic. The sky is literally full of galaxies. I cannot believe the number of birds. Absolutely extraordinary. The smell. It's not altogether unpleasant, very fishy. You look, every single available space is occupied. If there's not a bird there, it means they can't nest. On the last count, there were 12,000 birds, and every time they do a count here, the numbers are going up. And when you see them in the air, you understand why. These birds are incredible flyers. They will travel 200 miles away from here if they have to, to find food. And when they find it, they put on quite a show. Oh, there we go. <laughs> they are so quick off the mark. Whoa! I would love to be able to do that. They're like these people that are javelin, clearing their way through the water. They tuck their wings up just at the point they're about to hit the water. That locks their spine and helps them stay rigid as they hit the water. They really are like an owl. I just had to take a closer look. That was an absolutely amazing, unforgettable experience. I must thank Phil Harris for getting us out there. Now, one of the secrets to the Gannett's success is that they're able to fly these vast distances way offshore to make the most of unpredictable food supplies. But there is one problem that plagues them wherever they go. Take a look at this. Marine plastic pollution. Now these photos were sent to us by Robbie Brooks. He's a keen bird and photographer here in Shetland. And you can see, it's clear to say, I don't even know how that bird is flying with that plastic bag on his head. Now, just in the few minutes that we got to this beach, I did a quick beach clean, and this is all the plastic I was able to gather up in just a few minutes. Now some of this, creates a problem because of birds ingest them. But at this time of the year, for the gannets especially, they're out at sea collect, gathering nesting material. Now, what they should be looking for is seaweed floating out at sea. But as you can see with this piece here, this nylon rope gets tangled up. And when they get entangled in this, it's really tragic, devastating effects. Now, I have to warn you that this could be a slightly distressing image for some of you. Um, this is a tangled up bit of plastic but right in the bottom of the screen there there is a dead gannet so we can really see how this can cause a problem now scientist nina ohanlon of the university of the highlands and islands is trying to get a measure of the scale of the problem and one of the things she's trying to find out she's trying to answer three questions how many nests gannet nests contain plastic what percentage of the nests are made up of plastic and what type of plastic is it? Now, this is where you come in. If you're someone that regularly visits seabird nests, please record, take photos. Remember, stay safe. But if you can do this, please visit our website. You can find all the information you need of how you can send this to Nina O'Hanlon so she can get a baseline of the problem and then we can monitor whether the situation improves or worsens over time. Now, from one stunning coastline to another. April has arrived on the Gower, and the peninsula braces itself for an influx of breeding birds. 
But winter has been reluctant to loosen its grip this year, and the weather remains changeable, with foggy shadows sweeping over these clifftop homes. Spring is on hold, and many birds are still in search of a mate. But the raven family are well ahead of the rest. Perched on a sheltered cliff ledge, a large nest of twigs protects four chicks. Just over two weeks old, all have survived the challenges of the season so far. But growing mouths means growing stomachs, and the parents have to spend longer away from the nest to satisfy burgeoning appetites. And they have a new tactic. Now that the chicks can keep warm by themselves, the female can keep vigil from a vantage point above the nest while her partner forages further afield. Soon, even she will have to start foraging for them as well. Next to the raven's avian apartment are their restless relatives, the chuffs. After more than a hundred years of absence, they returned to breed on the Gower in 1990. Since that welcome return, their numbers have steadily built along this craggy coastline. There are several birds visiting the Raven Gully, but still no signs of nest building. Instead, they seem to spend their time reveling in flight, their broad, slotted wings providing superb stability in a skyborne symphony. Below the Raven's high-rise accommodation, a harbour porpoise breaks the surface. Drawing attention to the foreshore where an unobtrusive rock pipit plies its trade. This easily overlooked bird forages amongst the rocks for invertebrates when the tide is low. But it's not only food that's on the male's mind, he's also looking to impress and that means an extraordinary musical performance on the wing. Rising slowly, his song reaches crescendo at the apex of his flight before he parachutes gently down in a descending encore. It's a stunning visual and auditory display advertising his strength and prowess to any females and warning other males that this bit of shore is taken. Back near the raven nest, some other unruly relatives are causing a commotion. A pair of crows have taken exception to their larger corvid cousins. It's two to one as they repeatedly dive bomb one of the ravens. But ravens have aerial skills of their own and an acrobatic backflip leaves its feet free to fend off the attackers in mid air. With the crows in their place for now, the adult returns to the nest. It's three weeks since the chicks first hatched, but sadly, four chicks have become three. The demand for food in this challenging season and the constant battles with other species has meant the smallest chick couldn't make it. Instinctively, the adults will always feed the biggest, noisiest chick first, working down the pecking order to the smallest. When food is scarce, the smallest starves. It's nature's way of ensuring the overall brood has the best chance. Whether the remaining three chicks will survive remains to be seen.
It's always sad, isn't it, when one chick dies, but that's what happens if there's not enough food around. And it, three is pretty good, isn't it? Three is pretty good. That's yeah. the average for Raven, actually. So they're on target at the moment. And they're still doing really well. They're bringing in up to 70 feeds a day. That's a lot. Can't match the blue tits, but for a much larger bird, they're doing, a, they're doing a great job. And one unusual thing about ravens is that they are one of only two species of birds which sometimes begins to nest, lay eggs, in the wintertime in the UK, crossbills being the other. Now, they typically lay in early February, but they will do it in January or sometimes even December. So how do they manage to pull this off? Well, firstly, they're sedentary. They have a territory, and in the UK, they stay on that territory throughout the course of the year. So they don't have to set up a territory and build a nest. There's one already there. They can, they can fix it up. The other thing is they're monogamous. They stick together in pairs throughout the course of that time, so they don't have to find a mate, court that mate, go through all that rigmarole before they start laying their eggs. And the other key thing is their winter food because ravens are very resourceful they can eat a great range of things but in the winter they help themselves to a lot of natural carrion so there's plenty of deer like this and there's plenty of sheep for them to eat so unlike many other birds that suffer through the winter time because the mammals are suffering the ravens prosper and this means that the females in particular can go into that early breeding period in good condition capable of laying those eggs incubating them and looking after the young so the late spring definitely hasn't affected the ravens, but what we've noticed here is that it's really affected the raptors. And if you remember last year, we had a festival of raptors. We were following all sorts of birds of prey. I mean, this was the buzzard. If you remember the buzzard, it had one chick. This time last year, it was two and a half weeks old. There it is with a, a nice bit of worm spaghetti. Um, and here on Sherbourne, Chris, last year they had 17 nests, 14 were successful. Mm. This year, there's only three nests, only one has hatched, the other two have just got eggs on. So that's a massive difference. 17, 17 last year. 17 to three. Three this year. Way behind. And the same with the barn owls. If you remember this time last year, we were following a barn owl nest in the barn. Uh, they had three chicks this time last year. They were all different ages, nine days old, four days old, and one day old. This year, this is what we see, still on eggs. And in fact, there's only one pair that are on eggs. Last year, I think there were four pairs that successfully hatched their eggs. So it's a big difference. And I guess, particularly for the barn owls, they just weren't healthy enough to be able to actually produce eggs when, when the spring finally they're, came. They're so late. I mean, when you think about it, if that chick was nine days old and they've got an incubation time of 30, 31 days, that's almost 40 days late this year. So there are two things here. Firstly, why were they late and what are the repercussions going to be? Well, you're right. They're late because the females aren't in good condition. They got through the winter, everything was going fine. They were probably putting on body mass, which is basically what they need to do. And then all of a sudden, we had all of that snow. The ground froze, they weren't able to access those voles, and all the condition that they'd put on ready to start breeding dropped off. And it's only now that they've got that condition back up to the level where they're capable of producing those eggs. It's not just about the females, the males too. Sometimes a female can be sat on eggs, but if the male's not provisioning her with enough food because he's not fit enough, then she'll desert those eggs as well. So the repercussions, well, barn owls, we know they need to double brood. And basically, if they start an early brood in the spring, they can then follow on with a later brood in the summer. And this will mean that there's enough youngsters to get through the winter to replace themselves in the population. Population. So there's no doubt at the moment, if this trend continues and it's countrywide, that our barn owls are going to be having a pretty bad year. Unfortunately, it's already looking bad for the barn owls with the research that's been done. But, you know, that's late nesting. What about late arrivals? We said yesterday that swallows in particular, 65 days late. The first one was seen the 1st of April. But we want to know about three other particular birds and we want to know what you've seen. These are the birds you've got to look out for. Got to look out for house martins, swallows, I mean swifts, sorry, house martins, swifts and cuckoos. And we want to know, have you seen them arrive early? Have you seen them arrive late? Or have they not arrived at all? And what we want to sort of get is a picture of around the country, whether these birds have actually come in or not. And then I feel a graph might come I on. I feel a statistical representation. We've had yes. none so far. I mean, I think like, we definitely need that. And we're already getting reports that people are missing their house martins this year. So do send those Use in. Use the hashtag SpringWatch and send them to Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or even go on the website.
Let's join our guest presenter now, Steve Backshaw. Last night, you'll know, he was down on the Sherbourne Brook. In fact, he was underwater, I'm very pleased to say today. He's a little bit higher and a little bit drier. Steve. Well, I'm not that much drier. It's hammering down here. <laughs> but, I'm, yeah, it's, it's better than being chest deep in the water, I guess. In fact, I would say that this is one of the most civilised way of exploring any waterway, being in a canoe. You're slow, you're quiet, you're eye to eye with all the wildlife, and most of it just tends to totally ignore you. So I kind of feel like this should be in every single naturalist's toolkit. One bird, though, you don't need to worry away because they're far too robust for that as swans and over the last few years I've managed to gain quite a relationship with a couple of swans on my local patch because they've moved in uh, I'd say they were uninvited guests but for three years now they've been nesting on my lawn uh, last year they had five cygnets this year they're already on seven eggs but it seems the nesting instinct is so hardwired that they just won't stop. They're taking everything from my lawn. That's my highly expensive uh, carbon fibre kayak paddles there. And also you can see my garden hose. They've taken the entire thing and I, for one, am not brave enough to go and get it back. I'm pretty sure that if you were sunbathing on our lawn, pretty soon you would get dragged into that nest. Um, they are the most conspicuous birds on any waterway by far, it has to be, has to be said. But I really feel that if you're out here exploring on a river, it's important to use all your senses, not just sight. So you want to be using sound and taste and smell as well. And on that note, just yesterday, I was down at the boathouse, just down the river from here, and I found this, which is admittedly just a handful of soggy poo, but it's very special poo. This is spraint, and this is a sign of otters, and otters that you might be very, very lucky to see with the naked eye. But here at Springwatch, we do the hard work so you don't have to. I'm unveiling now Brook Cam. So this camera is going to be in place, watching the, the place where I found this otter spray. This is it right now. Nothing there uh, uh, now, but in the middle of the night, 2.30 in the morning, this is what Brook Cam managed to spot. The distinctive shape of one of our best loved mammals, the otter. And on a different night, another shot, fleeting admittedly, but this is an otter. Who knows what we might see over the next few weeks on this camera. Uh, it could be something as special as this look. It's a rat, and not Ratty the water vole. It is just a rat, a brown rat, but these highly adaptable, resourceful beasts are certainly capable of swimming, that's for sure. So, yeah, taste and, and smell are all very important when you're looking for wildlife, but also hearing as well. So if you go out looking for a kingfisher, which is one of those glory birds, every day you see a kingfisher is a special day. Just go out looking for a bright blue bird, you're highly unlikely to find it. If, though, you listen out for this call, not the most beautiful or complex of songs, but very, very distinctive. If you hear those notes and then look out for an even more distinctive flight pattern, a bird that's flying with almost clockwork, whirring of its wings over the surface of the water, dead straight, no bobbing to its flight pattern as you might find in other birds, and you follow that, you could well be lucky enough to find a kingfisher. So it may not be as beautiful as the songs of many other birds around here, but to me, it's definitely one of the most special. A, a much more noisy bird, though, is the coot, and that's one that is around all the time as well. Not a favourite of birders. This monochrome monster is one I guess we quite often think as being something that scares away the more special birds. But that's a mistake, because the coot has a dark side to its personality. So our cameraman, Lindsay, was out here very first thing in the morning, just after dawn. And in the first light of dawn, in a, a glorious mist, he saw this particularly brutal spectacle. Four coots going hammer and tongs, head to head, tearing chunks out of each other. And this didn't last for half an hour or so. It went on for three hours. Coots are without doubt territorial. They have that, that white frontal disc above the beak and the larger that is, the more dominant that bird is going to be. And they'll drive away pretty much anything they, they fear is wandering into their patch. And as you can see, they are quite prepared to fight for hours and hours and hours. I have absolutely no idea where they get the energy from. Uh, but uh, Chris and Michaela, I guess we're just lucky that the two of you don't fly like that. <laughs> you, haven't seen us, you haven't seen us in the canteen when it comes to sticky toffee pudding. I like the coot, though. The coot. It's the way Winston of birds.
you know, it's betmorehen.com. <laughs> it's a bit of hard stuff, isn't it? The coup does it's things a... <laughs> in. In fact, it does things in because last week lots of people saw this on Twitter. Look at this. Here is a coot, not fighting another coot, but actively drowning, yes, drowning a buzzard. 1,241 likes on Twitter. And this was sent in by Naomi Portnoy from Al Blasser's ward in the Netherlands. And she said, my first visual of the attack was the coot flapping, pecking and jumping on and off of the buzzard, by which time it was in the water. The buzzard was quite waterlogged and the coot made sure it drowned completely. And even when it was dead, the coot stood on the buzzard and continued pecking it for some time. That is extraordinary behaviour. You almost want to make... Maybe it was injured? It could have been injured, but she says there was a nest nearby with young coots in, so equally it could have been after the coots. It could have got in the water, got waterlogged. And, I mean, you've seen coots in action. Oh, I tell you, he's on that one. it's extraordinary. What isn't extraordinary is birds drowning other birds deliberately, and there is a master that lives amongst us that can do this, and this is the sparrowhawk. Here's a, a picture of a sparrowhawk drowning a green woodpecker, albeit not in a pool, but in mud. And here, another, uh, a second sparrowhawk, this time drowning a pigeon in a pond. And I've never seen it myself, but I've heard plenty of people who are reliable tell me that they've seen sparrowhawks catching birds in their garden, deliberately dragging them across the lawn and then plunging them into the pond. Someone I know saw a magpie dispatched like that. So this is obviously a method of killing which the sparrowhawk has perfected. Well, maybe that's what happened here, because just take a look at this extraordinary footage. This is someone's pond, and that is a sparrowhawk trying to drown a pigeon and that's exactly what maybe they did maybe they dragged the pigeon to that pond and funny enough this was a wildlife pond made to attract the wildlife i don't not quite sure she expected to attract this sort of wildlife sent in by ronnie bastone giles and this was filmed in epsom so you can see it's still trying to drown that pigeon it's a bit of a wobbly camera she's not she's not very steady with her camera work but look then look what comes in a fox comes in the sparrowhawk flies off and leaves that pigeon, which now looks pretty dead in the water, to the fox. Which minces about. It's for quite a bit a long of a time. wussy fox. Doesn't want to get it? its feet wet. My dog's a bit like that. Takes out the pigeon and says, Thank you very much. I'll have that. I mean, Chris, imagine that going on in your back garden. Oh, I know. You've got a sparrowhawk yeah. predating yeah. a pigeon, and yeah. then you've got a beautiful fox coming in. I mean, that's amazing. Okay, but imagine this. Imagine you're in Scotland and it's snowing, and a sparrowhawk swoops in, takes a male bullfinch, then tries to drag, you know, drown it in the pond, and a pine martin comes in. Well, imagine this. You've got a pond, you've got an orca in it, and it just oh. comes up and it takes a seal out of your pond. Yeah, Moving maybe on. I've got a bit far. I mean, mine was vaguely realistic. Far. Pine martin, <laughs> sparrow, bullfinch. Um, foxes are one of my favourite animals, and therefore, when I photograph them, it's a really hard job. You're trying to replicate the beauty of that animal, the passion that you feel for it. It's quite a tough thing to do. But I met a young man in 2016 who achieved that. Kyle Moore took this absolutely fantastic picture of a fox and there you can see Carl and I at the Young Photographer Awards, him receiving his award and here is the photograph that he's got. Now I love this photograph, I love the way he's done a long exposure to show the buildings behind and then he's flash lit the fox, you've got its head lit brilliantly there and the reflection in the puddle. It's a stonking photograph isn't it? It's unusual, it almost looks ghostly doesn't it, it's where you can see through the fox. Ghost of a fox, it's, it, it's absolutely brilliant I've got to say. And I'm very pleased to say that Kyle has continued his photography and he's continued to focus on his favourite subject. <laughs> So my name's Carl Moore and I'm a professional wildlife and nature photographer. My passion for natural history um, ignited at a very young age, as far back as I can remember. At the time I would sort of head down to my local nature reserve and try to photograph the barn owls caught in the marshlands. Photography for me is a real sort of, um, almost like an eye-opener. Lots of people don't even realise what's on their daughter, certainly in the cities. In the early days, I sort of um, try to photograph a lot of species at night because it's such a niche area of, you know, wildlife photography. And that's where my real passion lies nowadays. It just add the whole new dimension to the image. 
my favourite thing to photograph after dark is foxes because that's you know it's their time. Yeah, you know, I just love the way they sort of not only live in the sort of urban surroundings but also thrive. So this particular location is a really sort of um, good spot for urban foxes. Just be, um, behind us is a sort of um, main train line, and that's um, a real sort of highway for foxes in the towns and cities. When the streets quiet down, the foxes, you know, can get behind the sort of shops, and there's a lot of sort of easy meals for them. Three years ago, I actually founded the family of foxes, so I sort of learned that the cemetery was their sort of first port of call after darkness. When I first started working in the cemetery foxes, I could get nowhere near the individuals. But photographing them every single night over many seasons, you gain their trust, and it allows you to get that much closer to the foxes. At present, there's um, a dog fox, a vixen, and last year's female cubs. So, with these particular family of foxes, they allow me to, you know, follow them throughout the night, following their natural behaviours. So, this is Basil, the dog fox, which is a, the current sort of dominant male in the area. Out of all the sort of foxes I photograph, he's the boldest. He's got a sort of iconic um, white tip to his tail, so it's, it's always easy to sort of identify him. So this particular fox is um, last year's female. So this will probably be her last summer in the area, so it's her second year now. She'll hang around this year to help the current vixen with this year's young. And then next year, when she becomes sexually mature, she'll be dispersed out of the area, hopefully to raise a family herself. She's got a lot of sort of cheeky character in her. Often when the dog fox and the vixen is here, she sort of goes up and nip their tails, basically, which is a sign of sort of asking them for food, even though she's fully independent at this age. The most surprising thing that I've sort of discovered is um, just how loving they are towards one another. Quite often I'd sort of observe them just, you know, preening each other and playing in the long grass. And that is the real sort of spring flowers, like crocuses, bluebells, that sort of stuff, it's looking really sort of amazing. It's always a great feeling after working many weeks on one particular image to finally capture it. But again, I think there's always improvements you can take. Picture's never perfect. Working with the same family over sort of you know many seasons, you do get emotionally attached to them, and I'd love to continue following them for a further sort of season. You know, just see this year's cubs. It's a real nice feeling to have this animal trust you and allow you into their world. Top work. It's good, isn't it? I love the photos in the cemetery. I really like them. Yeah, those. they're not just photos. They've got a real style mm. to them. The way that they're sort of slightly over lit, but you can still see the background. They're, they're really, really classy. But there is one thing. Did you notice this photograph? Look, see this one here? All right, you see that photo? Yes, yeah, one that. of cars. Like that. Right, now look at yeah. this one. Look at this one. All right. See the one on the left there? Yeah. That's, uh, I took that in 1983. So what are you trying to say? That he copied I'm you? He's, he's ripped me off. Can, can I just point something out? 1983, yeah. he's 20 years old. Wasn't even born then. Wasn't even born. He's a youngster. No, okay. So he didn't... I don't think he ripped you off. I think he just had the same idea to yeah. take a picture yeah. of a load of old rubbish. Okay. yeah. <laughs> no, okay. no offence, because it was a load of old it rubbish. It is in a plastic dustbin, though. Mine was a nice, rusty one. Of course it's it would be. It's in the detail, Carl. Of course it's it would be. It's in the detail. <laughs> Moving on. Let's go back to Steve in the rain, finding out about the wondery, watery world of Sherborne. Yes, I, I guess I'm trying to focus on the surprising and secretive animals found here on Sherborne Brook. And you don't get any more secretive than snakes. I seem to be spending the majority of my adult life looking for snakes and only a tiny percentage of time actually finding them. But they are here and we have proof of it because this photo was sent in by local villager Moira Yip. It's of a grass snake and it was taken right behind me here in these reeds. And why not? I mean, this is a perfect place to find grass snakes. They're very adaptable. They're a lowland species, but they're found in a whole array of different places. The one thing is they are bound to water. We've got some fantastic images here of a grass snake moving through boggy, marshy terrain. And look at that sinuous, serpentine, slithering movement. Very similar to the way that they move across the surface of the water 
if they're swimming, except then all you would see would be the periscope of their head jutting out from the water and the wake they would leave behind as they move. And the real reason that they're so bound to this habitat is their diet. So a recent study here in England found that 63% of the diet of grass snakes was made up of frogs. The rest was made up of mammals, small birds, and occasionally of fish. So the fate of these two animals is inextricably intertwined. And there is some evidence to suggest that grass snakes are on the decline. It's very, very difficult to button that down, though, because we don't have an accurate population estimate of grass snakes here in the UK. However, just up the road from here in Bybury, there is a study going on with the National Trust. Bybury is just a chocolate box village. And if I know anything from watching Midsummer Murders, it's that a village this perfect has to have a dark secret. But this one doesn't. It's just kind of just as lovely as it looks. It is, though, full of tourists, and there's a lot of footfall there. But in the centre of the village is a flower-rich water meadow, and that is a haven for snakes. I went there the other day with ranger Ellie Castle to find out more. How long have you been studying grass snakes here? So I started back in November last year. So this is my first year, really, um, getting stuck into some snake monitoring, which I'm really enjoying. It's such a great feeling to find a grass snake. So I've got some quite nice pictures from snakes I've seen around here. You just spot those little yellow eyes. All these tourists, if they knew that these fields were full of snakes, would completely lose it. Oh yeah, I mean, I've had a few come <laughs> up to me and said, what, what are you looking for? And I say, oh, I'm looking for snakes. And they go, oh, oh. Go, oh, but why are you like that? They're amazing little creatures. And no, some people just don't understand. They get a bit of a bad rep sometimes, but they are lovely. Although part of this survey is just going out wandering, looking for grass snakes, there is one little trick that herpetologists all over the world use to attract reptiles, and that's simply putting down little bits of corrugated iron. Those warm up faster than the surrounding environment, and so reptiles, being so-called cold-blooded, will go underneath to thermoregulate, to suck up some of that warmth. So we wandered around checking out the, these bits of corrugated iron, and eventually we got lucky. Ah, yes, we have tiny a little, little tiny one. juvenile. Look at that. Wow. So it already has the classic bright yellow collar at the back of the head, barring running down the underside, and its eyes are blue. Look at that, it's getting ready to shed its skin. So that was a yearling. It would have hatched out of its egg just last year. This, though, is a mature adult grass snake, and it is a thing to behold. The females are rather larger than the males. They can get to be even bigger than this animal here. And we took the opportunity of having this wonderful rescue snake around to get some close-up shots of the grass snake, because I think they're worth looking at. Looking here at the, dorsal, the ventral sorry, scales of the animal, those are the ones that are primarily used for locomotion. As you move up the animal towards the head, you're going to get the distinctive signs that enable you to tell this apart from our other species of snake. So the yellow collar behind the head. If you were to get close enough to look it in the eye, you'd see a very different eye to the adder, which has a red eye and a vertical slit-shaped pupil, as opposed to the round pupil found on this of uh, the grass snake. Uh, the adder as well is a, a venomous snake. I certainly wouldn't be handling it like this. But grass snakes, you know, they're very timid animals. They're very loath to bite. In fact, what they usually do in defense is to emit a, a rather foul-smelling secretion from their anal glands, which has a smell that, once smelt, is never forgotten. In fact, it will be lingering on your clothes for the rest of your life. I, generally speaking, just chuck that T-shirt away because it's never going to get any better. And the last thing they will do, if they really feel threatened, is to feign death. They'll roll onto their back, the mouth sprawls open, the tongue is uh, sprawling alongside the mouth, and any predator that will only take live prey will leave them well alone. So right now, this is the distribution map of uh, <laughs> grass snakes in the UK. The red area is where they're known to occur, not famously in Ireland or in Northern Scotland, certainly not in Shetland, up where Juliana is right now. But let's face it, she's not suffering for a lack of fabulous wildlife. Thanks, Steve. Yes, we're 
back in Shetland at this gorgeous inlet of Piri Vo. I've been perched on this cliff watching seabirds soaring around and the key seabird here is the fulmar. These are absolutely beautiful birds. They're members of the petrel family, delicate, delicate birds and supreme flyers. Now over a hundred years ago they were very rare in Britain. In fact they didn't breed at all on the mainland and the first records of breeding fulmars on Shetland was in 1878. Since then they have been making their way, their progress south, all the way to Scotland. Actually even as far as Cornwall. And their secret to their success is their adaptability. They are surface feeders, they'll take fish, they'll take jellyfish, they'll take squid, they'll even take plankton. But surface feeding means that they also ingest ocean plastics. Now, the next photo might be a bit upsetting for some of you, but it does tell a really, really important story. This was sent in by Dr. Jan van Franeke from the Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And the stomach contents there, you can clearly see are marine plastics, particularly in this photo. Now, 95% of fulmars in the North Sea are estimated to have plastic in their stomach contents. Scientists are still investigating whether there is a direct link between marine plastics and cause of death. But at the very least, it tells the story and it says, indicates the scale of the problem. Now, we are waking up to the problem of marine plastics, but here on Shetland, as much as 30 years ago, the locals here were rolling up their sleeves and doing something about it. Today we're doing a Devour ride up at the Burrock Beach. Devour ride up is Shetland dialect for spring clean. We have, but this year we had 240 groups, uh, over 4,500 volunteers come out to all our dials, all inhabited dials is cleaned up. And we normally, this beach is one of the dirtiest ones we clean. We normally pick up somewhere around two to two and a half tonnes of litter after this beach every year. It started in 1988, we, I think, a couple of hundred volunteers. It very quickly grew, and now we have over 15% of our population takes part every year. Plastics is always by far the biggest kind of amount of stuff that we pick up. Every group reports plastics being their major thing that they pick up. In fact, some beaches, people are only finding plastics, nothing else. It's terrible. It's yeah. just a mess. These are ropes, more plastic, and more plastic. I just saw that dad put over there and it looked like it was probably eating too much plastic and it just it died. Well, a lot of it comes to locally, local industry, local folk, but there is things that travel very long distances. For example, today we'll ask the Burns and we ask all our volunteers to collect lobster pot tags. They come from Maine, Rhode Island, Canada, America, and all around, and it just shows how far. It's such a unique piece of litter because you can trace it back to where it was put in the water. So we can then show how far to the Burns, how far it travels, and how it comes in currents to Shetland. Now that's really incredible work, but beach cleans are just scratching the surface of the problem, but they are still important to do because they connect us to the problem. They get us talking about it and doing something about it. So here on the Shetlands, we've been talking about the threats to our seabirds. Further south in North Yorkshire, we have been following the fortunes of a very charming farmland bird. Early spring in North Yorkshire, home to an increasingly rare farmland bird, the lapwing. It's the start of the mating season, and the males have already begun their spectacular song flights, soaring over contested territories. Rivals swoop in parallel patterns, echoing each other's peewit call in a display of agility designed to impress. North Yorkshire location offers a choice of nesting sites. Moorland on one side, and across the wall, farmland. 
It's a gamble on both sides. Both have hazards and advantages for nesting lapwings. Farmland nests are more exposed on the closely cropped grass, but have better visibility to watch out for predators. The moorland nests are on higher ground, where the wind is stronger and the rain heavier. But the long grass hides eggs and chicks, providing vital cover. This male has gone for the moorland territory. He flies low, beating his wings with loud whooshing sounds to signal his territorial claim. Then it's a speedy descent to the ground. He's caught the eye of a female. Scratching a temporary scrape into the ground, he displays his bright tail coverts. An interruption from a rival male is soon seen off. And he's definitely impressed the female. She's ready to mate. Back on the farmland side of the wall, a female lapwing also has a nest. Her shallow nest scrape is lined with dry grass and four eggs lie well camouflaged. But in this habitat, that isn't always enough. Another female has been driven off her nest by a lamb. It may just be curious, but sheep have been recorded eating ground nesting birds. So could this be a wolf in sheep's clothing? Feigning injury, the female tries to draw the lamb away. But to no avail, despite her efforts, the lamb finds the nest. Once it finally retreats, the female is left to remove a broken egg. It's one less chick she's going to hatch this year. Nesting on the ground makes lapwings vulnerable to a whole host of predators on both sides of the wall, each dealt with in its own particular way. For a pheasant, it's an aerial bombardment. Life here is a constant battle of vigilance and deterrence. Three weeks have passed and there's finally movement on the farmland. Two tiny lapwing chicks are taking a walk. The chicks are precocial, which means they can walk within hours of hatching. And for these chicks, there's a move afoot, from the exposed nest site to the field margins, where the longer grass provides more cover. Here in North Yorkshire, the lapwing population is doing relatively well. But across the UK, lapwing numbers have declined drastically in recent years, with changes in land use and farming practices putting their breeding habitats under threat. That means that the chicks that have made it this far are vital for this declining species and will hopefully return as adults next year to begin this cycle once more. Nice to see the lapwing there, but what about being trampled by the sheep? And as I mentioned in the film, sheep actually eating wading birds, something we might not have heard of before. But recently, the RSPB and the University of East Anglia have recorded this. This is a curlew's nest in the Brecklands. And you can see the curlews there incubating her eggs. This is the head of the sheep that comes in. And you'll see that after a bit of persistence, 
the sheep manages to push the curlew off of its nest. Now, you may think it's just being curious and, and wondering what the curlew's doing, but look, as soon as the curlew's gone, the sheep is head down and it eats the curlew's eggs. And they've witnessed this on a couple of occasions. Sometimes the curlews have managed to keep the sheep away, but on this occasion they didn't. It's extraordinary behaviour, but it's not just sheep that are doing it because the BTO worked with the University of East Anglia in 2008 and they witnessed this. Now this fabulous little bird is a nightjar, ground nesting bird, it's on eggs and you can see, it can see a predator and it's doing that broken wing display trying to get rid of the predator. What's the predator? It's a fallow deer. So the fallow deer is sniffing out that nest and eventually it eats the egg. And it's not just fallow deer that have been seen doing it, muntjac deer have been seen doing it on woodlark chicks. Eating woodlark chicks as well. It's extraordinary. I found another study published in 1988 by Rob Furness on the Isle of Fula. And during the time that he was studying the Arctic terns there, he found that 680 of them, this is the chicks, not the eggs, were eaten by sheep along with 10 Arctic skewer chicks. Now, let's be very clear, these are herbivores, they're not going out nest hunting. But what we think is happening here is that they're coming across these nests and there's some nutrient deficiency in their diet. It may just be the calcium from the eggshells that they want, and it's this that's leading them to eat them. But given that we've got somewhere in the region of 33 million sheep in the UK, and 6.4 million of them are in our uplands, and in 2009 we only had about six, uh, you know, uh, uh, 68,000 pairs of Curlew, and they've declined since. It would be interesting to know what impact sheep might be having on our wading bird population, if any. It could be learned behaviour as well, they remember, you know, particularly with the 600. And, and it might only be in areas where they have these mm. nutrient deficiencies, but we don't know. And there's a lot of sheep out there. Fascinating behaviour there. And if you see anything like that, we'd love to hear about it. There are plenty of ways you can get in contact with us and plenty of ways that you can watch. The easiest way to reach us is to go online and be our friend on social media. You can like us on Facebook, adding your pictures and comments to our page. Follow us on Instagram and tag us into your photographs, or tweet us your questions at BBC Spring One. And don't forget, you can watch the live cameras day and night at bbc.co.uk slash springwatch. And you could also watch those live cameras on the red buttons. Great thing to do. They're on 20 hours a day. Steve, nice to see you. Well, a little bit dry. Yeah, it's nice and warm in here, isn't it? Should we swap jobs tomorrow? <laughs> no, you're out <laughs> no, there. No. I've got a very quick question for you um, from Alex Page. I've seen adders in the wild. Love to see a grass snake. Can you give me any tips for finding one? Well, most of the time it's just serendipity but if you're looking to make it happen it's all about timing so going out on a, a moist summer's day when it's cloudy in the morning and then the sun comes out you're quite likely to see them out basking in an evident area south facing massive vegetation alongside a riverbank um, that's the best best chance you have of really going out and trying to find them you've got to look for them haven't you because most people yeah. don't just come across them really absolutely unless they're in your manure your manure or your compost heap yeah absolutely well, sadly, that's all we've got time for today. We will be back, of course, tomorrow. And Gillian is heading north to look for the Shetland's most famous mammal. And I'm going to be investigating this home for a multitude of beasts. It's an ancient oak, and I'm going to be spending the night in it. And, of course, we'll be showing you all the drama as it unfolds with our live cameras. And there are our blue tips. So the Spring Watch soap will continue. We'll see you tomorrow. We'll be catching up with all our live cameras. Don't forget to watch them, as we were saying, on the Internet and on the red button as well. We'll see you tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Bye-bye. Good night.